When discussing the Axis powers of World War II, history tends to focus on Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, and Mussolini's Italy. However, this is only part of the story. Fascism and anti-Semitism were by no means limited to Hitler and his closest allies in Tokyo and Rome. Indeed, far-right extremist ideologies had taken hold in several European countries, making them potential allies for Berlin. Particularly when considering the natural hostility such policies attracted from the communist superpower of the Soviet Union. One such nation that found itself seduced by the same fascist ideals as Germany was Romania. Historic anti-Semitism combined with a fear of communism led Romania down a dark path when surrounded by potential enemies who viewed its lands with jealousy, this including the powerful Soviet Union. Romania began working alongside Hitler's Germany on what the leaders of both countries saw as nothing short of a holy crusade against those they believed to be conspiring against them, stifling them, and holding them back from achieving their true destiny of greatness in the world. But working with the devil comes at a terrible price. In this episode, we are going to examine the involvement of Romanian soldiers in one of the most brutal chapters of the Holocaust, where hatred manifested itself in its purest forms against those who had no way of fighting back. This is the story of the 1941 Odessa Massacre. Welcome to Wars of the World. The late 1930s was a time of political uncertainty for Romania. The country still had a monarchy ruled by King Carol II, who had already once abdicated the throne, leaving it to his son Michael I, following his controversial relationship with Magda Lupescu, a married woman who was known to have Jewish ancestry. Too young to rule, a regency was established until Michael came of age, but it proved wholly ineffective, prompting Carol II to return to the throne in 1930 after a brief exile to Paris. Additionally, fear of the neighboring Soviet Union and age-old grievances with the Jewish community continued to afflict the country's internal politics. The December 1937 elections proved inconclusive, prompting King Carol II to install his preferred candidate for Prime Minister, Octavian Goga. The king believed that Goga's government would only be temporary, and that after it collapsed, he would be able to fully assert his grip over his country. Goga's government was indeed short-lasting, but in just under two months, he had instigated numerous anti-Semitic policies that made discrimination against Jews official policy. Echoing some of the Nuremberg laws of Germany, Goga's government stripped the Jewish population of their citizenship, limiting their rights to do business, and introduced some social doctrines that generally made life for the Romanian Jews extremely unpleasant. While endorsed by Goga's brief government, the moves were more about gaining the support from the so-called Iron Guard, a vehemently anti-Semitic movement whose popularity threatened the authority of even the king himself. However, these policies had a damaging effect on Romania's economy, made worse by the subsequent souring of relations with its traditional allies of Britain, France, and Czechoslovakia. The natural knock-on effect of this was closer links to Nazi Germany. However, that was threatened by the invasions of Czechoslovakia in 1938 and Poland in 1939. In the latter case, Romania had a mutual defense treaty with Poland, but Poland actually requested that Romania not honor it. The idea being that keeping Romania neutral allowed the country to serve as a bridge for Poles fleeing the German war machine. One of those who served in Goga's brief government was a former army officer named Ion Antonescu, who took the office of defense minister and was later absorbed into King Carol's own government after his political maneuvering left him as the final authority in the country. Antonescu's anti-Semitism rivaled that of some of Hitler's own top echelon, as was his fear of leaving the Soviet Union unchecked. In Antonescu's mind, the two struggles were one and the same. Him seeing the Soviet Union as populated by Jews, bent on spreading anarchy across the continent, either through economic or military means. This stance, and the hostility it invited from abroad, brought him into conflict with the king on numerous occasions. But things finally came to a head in the summer of 1940. By then, the Soviet Union had made it clear that it intended to annex the Romanian territories of Bessarabia and northern Bukovina along their borders, as well as the Herza Islands, citing historical claims as justification. 
On June 26, 1940, Moscow issued an ultimatum to King Carol II, demanding Romanian forces withdraw from the regions before the Red Army invaded. Much to the fury of Antonescu and many of those who subscribed to his far-right ideologies, the king agreed to the Soviet Union's terms in order to avoid a war. This territory, as well as additional Romanian islands along the Danube, became integrated into the Moldavian Soviet Socialist Republic, an independent entity within the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic of the Soviet Union. This was humiliating and intolerable for Antonescu, made worse by further territorial losses to Bulgaria and Hungary. His country was being eroded away and the king appeared ineffective to stop them. Therefore, Antonescu organized an alliance with the Iron Guard to remove him from power. The two forces enacted their plans to remove the king on September 6, 1940. Shortly after, he removed the threat from the Iron Guard, adopting the title of Conducator of Romania. Firmly seated in power, he then began to make moves to align his country with the only nearby ally with similar ideologies of his own, and at that time was one of the most powerful nations on earth, having defeated many of its traditional enemies on the battlefield and dominating much of Western Europe. That country was of course, Nazi Germany. In the days of the Tsars prior to the Russian Revolution of 1917, Odessa was a fairly modern, opulent, and multicultural city by imperialist Russian standards. Located on the banks of the Black Sea, the comparatively new city was known to many even outside of Russia as the Pearl of the Black Sea, and they embraced the promise of capitalism and international trade, consequently making the city far more tolerant of different ethnicities within its city limits when compared to other Russian cities and towns. For the Jewish population of Russia, this offered them somewhere they felt they could both raise their families and do business in relative safety, away from the rampant anti-Semitism that blighted other cities and towns of the immense Russian Empire in this period. The Jewish population of Odessa thus rose significantly during the 19th century, until the 1897 census revealed that Jews were by then Odessa's second largest ethnic group, covering 34.41% of the city's population. Their number was only surpassed by the Russians, who formed 45.58%, while the remainder comprised of Ukrainians, Poles, Germans, and Greeks. Despite not being the largest single group, the Jewish population was seen as being so high that to most Russian people it was effectively a Jewish city. Unfortunately, this perception coupled with the city's success and the seemingly affluent lifestyle of its population only further fueled anti-Semitism in Russia particularly amongst its impoverished lower classes, who saw Jews as conspiring together to line their own pockets. This hostility forced even greater Jewish migration to the city. When the Bolsheviks under Vladimir Lenin seized power in the October 1917 revolution, creating the Soviet Union, things appeared to be changing for the better for Jews in Russia. The great experiment in communism and brotherhood meant that it became an official policy to outlaw anti-Semitism and the new Soviet authorities even made cultural efforts to surpass such sentiments, with movies and plays portraying Jewish life and struggles, almost the reverse of the propaganda that was later produced in Hitler's Germany. Unfortunately, by the late 1930s, there appeared to be some pushback to this effort as anti-Semitism re-emerged, but largely, it festered beneath the surface of the city's older population, while the youngest generation who knew little of life before the revolution appeared were more open to full integration of all in Odessan society. Jews and non-Jews often described their relationships with one another during this period as civil, but not close, and despite the best efforts of the Soviet authorities, there was still a largely them and us mentality amongst the general population. However, the real threat to Odessa's Jews of course reared its head on June 22, 1941, when Germany and its collection of Eastern European allies, including Romania, launched their largest invasion in history. Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of Soviet Union. The Axis forces numbered a staggering 3.8 million men, this number exceeding Soviet frontline troops stationed on the massive country's western border by 1 million men. In retaliation for Romania's siding with Hitler, on June 24, 1941, the Soviet Air Force bombed the Romanian city of Yash the raid causing fairly minor damage, but two days later, another raid took place, causing a much greater impact. This angered the local population, who were told that Jewish saboteurs were responsible for guiding the aircraft to the city, ignoring the fact that a number of Jews were themselves killed in the bombing. 
and what followed was an orgy of murder against the Jewish population in the city. 13,266 people, ranging from infants to the elderly, were beaten, shot, or died after being herded into railway wagons as they were deported away from the city, these carriages being so overcrowded that many were crushed to death. In Bucharest, Antonescu found he was playing catch-up to Hitler's Wehrmacht, for despite having a say in the final planning stages for Barbarossa, Antonescu had only been given scant warning from the Führer that he intended to launch the offensive. As such, aside from minor skirmishes along the border between Romania and the Soviet annexed territories of Bessarabia and northern Bukovina in the closing weeks of June, it would not be until the beginning of July when the Romanian armed forces had fully mobilized to strike out against the Red Army. On July 1st, with the support of the 11th Army under General Eugen Ritter von Schobert, the Romanian contingent, dubbed Army Group Antonescu, attacked the Soviet southern flank along the Prut River. Army Group Antonescu comprised the 3rd and 4th Romanian armies, with 15 divisions, 9 brigades, and 325,619 personnel. In terms of equipment, they fielded 223 light tanks and tankettes, 28 armored cars, 365 aircraft, and 2,307 light to heavy artillery pieces. As the group name implied, it was under the overall command of Antonescu, who was also promised command of Schobert's 11th Army by Hitler, although in practice, Schobert still answered to the German chain of command. By the end of July, Antonescu's alliance with Hitler appeared to have paid off when a joint German-Romanian force recaptured the latter's lost territories upon the completion of Operation München. Just like with the German army, as Antonescu's forces swept across the countryside, with it came the cleansing of the land of Jewish people. Barely a week after the start of the Romanian offensive, on July 8, 1941, Romanian counterintelligence outlined instructions to its agents in the field ahead of the main force, requiring them to instigate so-called acts of spontaneous anti-Jewish violence against the local population. The instructions divided the contested territories between three Romanian counterintelligence subdivisions and sponsored the creation of agitative teams from among the local inhabitants, even providing them with itineraries of when best to stir up trouble. These teams were assembled in the villages of Nemceni, Rezeni, Tocilu, Liova, and Kenia, and were chosen either for their loyalty to Romania or for their hatred of the Soviets and for Jews. Each team comprised of two to four local villagers, who were tasked with energizing their local communities to turn against communists and Jews by spreading disinformation through friends, family members, and work colleagues, with the aim of inspiring, as Romanian counterintelligence coined it, quote, the idea of collective defense against Judaic danger, end quote. It was not difficult for these Romanian agents to stir up trouble, since anti-Semitism still lingered among the local populations, and it needed only a nudge to bring it out into the open once again. Furthermore, with the Red Army in retreat, many Soviet citizens were eager to prove there were no threat to the seemingly unstoppable German and Axis armies in order to avoid bombing or shelling. Some locals even viewed the invaders as liberators at the time, for they themselves were no strangers to brutal treatment at the hands of the Soviets. The best way to prove themselves to the fascists was to hand over or even publicly kill Jews in front of the invaders and to pledge their support for their anti-Semitic crusade. Once again, the Jewish population found themselves fleeing the countryside in search of some kind of safe haven. They found this amongst fellow Jews in Odessa, but hot on their heels were the Germans and the Romanians. Having secured their lost territories, Romanian forces joined in the wider offensive against the Soviets, marching across Ukraine towards the Black Sea. Defending Odessa was the Soviet 9th Independent Army and the rapidly formed Separate Coastal Army, both of whom were supported by the guns and aircraft of the Soviet Navy's Black Sea Fleet. Odessa's defenders proved a particularly tough nut to crack, and so the Romanians and Sherbet's 11th Army were forced to instead lay siege to the city hoping to strangle it into submission. The siege began on August 8, 1941, and lasted two months and eight days, coming to an end on October 16th, by which time the surviving Soviet troops had either capitulated or retreated, but it cost the Romanians a painful 93,000 casualties, nearly a quarter of the force they had begun Barbarossa with. On the home front, Antonescu was facing intense criticism from both civilian and military leaders for the conduct of the invasion, 
but Antonescu ignored calls to bring Romanian troops home, either because he fully believed in the righteousness of the invasion, or because he feared what Hitler might do in response if he did. He was also basking in the glory of capturing Odessa, which for a time saw him surpass Italy's Benito Mussolini as Hitler's closest and most trusted ally. In the captured city, Mihail Zaslavsky was a 16-year-old Jew when he saw Romanian troops arrive on his street, supported by Ukrainian collaborators. In a 2018 interview, he recalled what happened. Quote, on October 19, 1941, a fascist Romanian officer came to our house with two soldiers and a Ukrainian interpreter. We were told, Jews, pack your things, you have 20 minutes. My mother grabbed what she could. When we came out, the neighbors from our house were standing at the gate. I looked around. There were neighbors from the surrounding houses in front of every gate. The boys with whom I played football and grew up with. People I saw every day. Neighbors who were friends or enemies. All these people had one question written on their faces. Why? We were brought to the school number 121. That was a new school with four stories. We were detained there until the next morning. The next day, escorted by barking dogs and the blows of rifle butts, we were led to the prison on the old Porto Frankskaya street. On both sides of the streets, there were friends, schoolmates, and their parents who couldn't help us and watched in shock. But there were also rascals who came and grabbed our bags away from us. End quote. As before, a new effort was made to stir up anti-Semitic sentiment within the city's population prior to the Axis forces' arrival. However, the effort did not enjoy as much success as it had done elsewhere. As a German intelligence report had noted, unlike in the surrounding countryside, within the city, the people tended not to think of each other along ethnic lines and instead saw themselves as one community. That was now intolerable to the new Romanian authorities and the appointed chief military administrator of the city, General Ioan Glogoyanu. Glogoyanu, the commander of the Romanian army's 10th Infantry Division, ordered the non-Jewish people to be subjected to anti-Semitic propaganda and conspiracy theories as well as Nazi positions on blood purity. On October 22, 1941, Glogoyanu had barely been at his post for a few hours, settling into his new office in the former NKVD building, once belonging to the Soviet Interior Ministry. When at 15.30 hours, a phone call was received from two men claiming to be communist saboteurs, warning that a bomb had been planted in the building and it was about to go off. Despite several acts of sabotage and bombing in the days prior, conducted by partisans fighting from hidden bases within the city's catacombs, the warnings were largely ignored, as a previous phone call claiming the same turned out to be false. At 17.50 hours, the building exploded. 67 people, including General Glogianu, were killed. A German report into the incident, dated November 4, 1941, sent to the German military mission in Bucharest, outlined their justification for what happened next. Quote, There can be no doubt that the explosion was set off by a remote control electrical device. In the morning hours of October 23rd, in the immediate vicinity of the destroyed building, a complete telephone system was discovered under the bed of a Jew. It was presumed to be directly connected with the NKVD men in the catacombs. The detained Jew stated that the Partisan attacks were being directed from the catacombs. End quote. Marshal Antonescu was outraged upon hearing the news of the bombing. Within hours, he had contacted General Nikolai Tataranu and instructed him that he should begin a campaign of reprisals against those responsible. The next morning, Romanian troops joined by German Einsatzgruppen units moved out into the city. Orders were issued that every Jew in the city should report to the village of Dalnik by the afternoon of the following day, lest they be shot on the spot. Meanwhile, the search for the communists progressed with fury. Across the street from where Glogoyanu and his men had been killed, troops forced their way into the apartments of unfortunate Odessa citizens who just happened to live in the wrong place and shot or hanged anyone they found without exception, including the young and the elderly. Their reasoning was simple. Whether they supported the partisans in the catacombs or not, killing them would prevent them from aiding in the future and go towards the collective punishment of those in the city who were still responsible. Moving out further, the Axis death squads raided numerous streets and markets of the cities and suburb, seizing Jews and ordinary people at random, many of whom knew nothing of the bombing but were still thrown up against fences and walls to be shot publicly, often in front of family and friends. In the Alexandrovsky Prospect, 
Some 400 people were arrested and driven to the site of former Red Army artillery warehouses on Lustdorf Road. Some of those who were marched to the warehouse were members of the Zavlasky family, including young Mikhail. In his own words, he tells us, quote, I was carrying my five-year-old brother and we had barely reached the bunker when they yanked him away from me. I was given a terrible blow in the back. I could not tell if it was from a foot, a rifle butt, or a baton, but in any case, I was sent to the side where men, including elders and teenagers, were standing. They were brought to the last building at the back. My mother and my siblings, I was the oldest of five, landed in another barrack. Everything was showered with gasoline or another fuel and set on fire. After some time, when everything was burning, I noticed that the fire had burned a hole on one side of the building. I rushed through it. I came out and there was a barrier, but it wasn't a barrier like in concentration camps. It didn't have barbed wire. So I found my way through the fence and ran. I immediately heard machine guns shooting in the background. I heard screams. I heard bodies falling. I heard footsteps. I turned around and saw that the other warehouse was burning and that the flames were raging into the sky. I reached a cornfield that had already been harvested. So I snaked my way through it until I reached an area covered with trees. I fell there breathless. I rested until the evening. Then in the evening, I went through the back areas and alleys of Odessa. I knew the city very well, until I reached the Polish cemetery. I climbed over its walls and spent the night there. My sister Eva, 12 years old, and another sister, Shenya, who was nine. My younger brother, Ilya, who I had carried there. My mother had a baby, Anna, in her arms. They were all burned to death. They became ashes. It is said that the smell of the burned bodies was in the air for several days. End quote. The cold and calculating nature of the mass murder taking place in Odessa can be found in the report from Lieutenant Colonel Mihail Nicolescu of the Romanian Gendarmerie. He stated, quote, Military Command of the Mountains Odessa brings to the attention of the population of Odessa and its surroundings that after the terrorist act committed against the military command on October 22nd, on the day of October 23rd, 1941, were shot. For every German or Romanian officer and civilian official, 200 Bolsheviks. And for every German or Romanian soldier, 100 Bolsheviks. Taken hostages, which, if repeated such acts, will be shot together with their families. End quote. Elsewhere, nearly 100 men were seized and shot near the city's big fountain, while about 200 people were executed in the Slobodka neighborhood. Random acts of violence, particularly targeting Jews, continued. Those not simply beaten to death or shot in the streets were herded into buildings where they were machine gunned or had hand grenades thrown at them. Or as befell the fate of Mikhail's family, they were simply set on fire and burned to death. Near Dalnik, where Jews were ordered to report lest they be shot in the street, some 5,000 people had assembled by the specified time. Lieutenant Colonel Nikolai Delanu of the Romanian Army's 10th Machine Gun Battalion selected 50 people from the crowd and marched them to a nearby anti-tank ditch, where he instructed his men to shoot them. One by one, the helpless men and women fell into the trench, the last sounds they ever heard being the angry, hate-filled roar of the weapons of an Axis firing squad. The remainder were allowed to return home, being told that they had been forgiven for a crime which many of them only had the most fleeting knowledge of having taken place at all. Tired and frightened, they trundled back into the city, only to find that their homes and property had been seized, and many were now left with only the clothes on their back and a harsh Ukrainian winter on the way. In those terrifying 48 hours, over 34,000 people had been butchered by the German and Romanian occupation forces. In the first week of the Axis forces entering the city, Odessa's population had been reduced by 10%. These events are generally referred to as the Odessa Massacre, but of course, life for Jews under the extremely anti-Semitic Romanians and their Nazi German allies was never going to be free from persecution. The Jewish survivors, who according to a Romanian investigation in the subsequent weeks, numbered over 60,000 people in Odessa, lived with some of the most oppressive restrictions placed upon them. As in other territories occupied by the Nazis, they were forced to wear a yellow Star of David on a black background to easily identify them in public, and perhaps just as importantly to the new Axis authorities, to recognize non-Jews who continued to fraternize with them. Even those with only one traceable Jewish ancestor in their family tree were branded as being tainted by Jewish blood. 
Despite the threats of further reprisals, many Jews realized that they had no future unless they fought back. And so they went to join the partisans, still fighting in the catacombs below. Mikhail Zaslavsky, the only surviving member of his family, went into hiding and was eventually helped by a growing underground railroad to help Jews by providing him with fake ID papers, allowing him to disappear into the city's population. Indeed, despite the atrocity, the threats of further violence and the anti-Jew propaganda campaign, there were still those in the Mont's multicultural city who refused to submit to the fascist oppression and persecution, whether they were Jewish or not. One notable case concerned Professor Evgeny Shevelev, the head of the city's psychiatric clinic, who along with his son Andrei concocted a plan to save as many Jewish staff and patients at the clinic as possible in the weeks after the massacre. Shevelev manufactured files on 20 patients at the clinic, who in reality were Jewish members of staff and destroyed the actual files which would have revealed their heritage. Thus, with the help of his son and some trusted colleagues, by the beginning of 1942, officially there hadn't been any Jewish staff or patients in the clinic, allowing his former colleagues to simply be discharged once they were listed as cured. However, Shevelev was not content with saving just 20 people, and soon he began creating patient files for Jewish friends and their relatives, and eventually he created his own underground railroad at the clinic for Jews to escape into. The exact number of Jews saved by the Shevelevs is obviously unknown, since they weren't exactly going to keep a record of them for the Germans or Romanians to find, but he is still a highly thought of figure in Odessa for his efforts. Unfortunately, Shevelev couldn't save everyone, and within a few weeks of the massacre, the persecution of the Jews stepped up a gear. On November 7th, 1941, Romanian authorities issued a directive that required all male Jews aged 18 to 50 to report to the jail on Bolsh Fontanskaya Road and to bring with them only the essentials. Not only would any Jewish violators of this order be shot on sight, but the directive also made it clear that any non-Jew who harbored a Jewish man within this age range or was aware of one living nearby but didn't tell the authorities would themselves be sentenced to death. As if having their men taken away from them wasn't bad enough, Jewish wives and mothers were required to deliver their food to the prison, knowing that if they didn't, then the guards would simply allow them to starve to death. More directives followed. These included all remaining Jews to surrender lists of their belongings, knowing full well that they would eventually be seized. Forgetting even the most worthless item was enough to warrant the harshest penalty of all. Eventually, a ghetto was established in the Slobodka area, considered to be one of the most impoverished in the city. Here Jews were forced to live in appalling conditions as the temperature through December and into the new year plummeted, resulting in many dying from hypothermia, starvation and disease. But even at this low point in their existence, worse was to come for them. Outside of the city, a concentration camp had been erected near the village of Bodganovka. Beginning in December, Jews from Odessa and the neighboring territories were herded into the camp, where thousands of them were killed by Einsatzgruppen death squads. In January 1942, the ghetto was emptied of its residents, who were forced onto death marches out to Bogdanovka and other camps established in the region. The German and Romanian guards tasked with marching these Jews showed little concern for their prisoners. Anyone, regardless of age or gender, who appeared to slow down the group was shot or bayoneted without mercy but many simply died from exposure or exhaustion. Their plight was made even worse by local Ukrainians, paying the guards to give them whatever belongings the Jews had on them which they took a fancy to. While most accounts label the Odessa massacre as concerning the events between October 22nd and 24th, 1941, the ongoing killing of Jews whilst the city remained under the German and Romanian occupation after these events have also been placed under this title. As such, the death toll rises exponentially to over 100,000, more than half the pre-war Jewish population of Odessa. But as the doomed Jews marched out of the city over that harsh winter, elsewhere fate was intervening again, only this time it conspired against the Axis. Hitler's promise that the Soviet Union would simply evaporate when he and his allies charged into the vast country proved wholly untrue. For despite German troops getting tantalizingly close to Moscow itself, his advance eastward slowed to a halt in the brutal Soviet winter. This bought time for the Soviets to relocate much of their war production eastward, away from German interference, and with the help of their Western allies, to build up their forces ready for the war of attrition that was to come. 
Within two years of the massacre, the Soviet Union's Red Army was charging back westward towards Odessa, which made the Romanian troops extremely anxious about reprisals for what they had done during their occupation of the city. Eventually, they stopped cooperating with their German counterparts when it came to marching Jews, gypsies, and other so-called undesirables off to extermination camps, instead employing them as laborers to build up defenses and repair damage from Red Air Force bombing raids. It was as if they believed that by changing their treatment of the Jews and others, that they were washing their hands clean of the stain of the massacre. In spring 1944, the push to drive out the Germans and Romanians began, and on April 10th, Odessa was formally retaken by the Soviet Union. By this time, the city had sustained terrible damage from a combination of artillery and air bombardment, and general neglect during the occupation. The very next day, the Red Army received a new recruit in the form of Mihail Zaslavsky, who emerged from his two years of hiding, eager to avenge his family's deaths. On August 23, 1944, King Carol II's son, Michael I, overthrew Antonescu in a coup d'etat. And following the war, Antonescu was put on trial for his part in both the massacre and the Holocaust at large, as were several others. Convicted of war crimes, he was sentenced to death and was executed on June 1, 1946. Soviet authorities did make efforts to return some of the Jewish property taken by the Soviet collaborators during the occupation. But it was an almost impossible task, and many Jewish families, as well as losing loved ones, also lost precious family heirlooms. In the early 1990s, in Odessa's Prokhorov Sky Square, where the road of death to the extermination camps began, a memorial commemorating the victims of the Holocaust was created. Additionally, an Alley of the Righteous Among the World was also created, featuring trees planted in honor of each Odessa citizen who had helped Jews escape the clutches of death at the hands of the fascists. This including father and son Evgeny and Andrei Shevelev. These memorials remind us that humanity is simultaneously capable of great evil, but also of having equally great courage to stand against such evil.